So uh, we're having a hybrid session, uh, quite excitingly now. So we have Will Tanner here, who's going to speak third. We have our presenters here uh, up on the screen, both Peter and Sarah. So I'm going to have really not too many preliminary remarks because we are starting a little bit late. We're going to have leave some time for questions. But we are really going to get straight into the, the theme of today uh, in our second session, which really is what does the evidence tell us? So it's really an evidence-focused session. We're going to hear from research that's looked both uh, at the impacts of the Community Wealth Fund and also the New Deal uh, for Communities programmes to get an insight into where really what we need to go in terms of uh, making levelling up a success. I think also, hopefully, we'll have a chance to reflect on some of the particular questions that came up uh, in our opening session, which is when we see the breadth uh, of levelling up and some of the missions associated with levelling up, which Andy described to us, uh, how do you uh, create metrics, how do you develop evidence for what is actually a much broader uh, and broader programme, perhaps, than some of the ones we've seen before uh, in the area of addressing a place-based inequality and regeneration. What we'll do now is go to our first speakers uh, who are online. So our first speaker is uh, Sarah Snelton from uh, Frontier Economics. So Sarah, uh, we go straight to you. Uh, hopefully you can hear us. Uh, and the room is here and our colleagues are online. I just apologise as well before we start to those who are online. We had some little connection issues in, in our first uh, keynote session. Hopefully they've been ironed out now. So those online as well. If you have questions online, please ask them. Do an online question here to prove that online people actually are out there. It's not just kind of just you in here and just kind of making it up. Anyway, Sarah, no, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. And I can just about hear you, but um, apologies if I miss something. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, got a few slides I'll talk through. Okay, so what I wanted to do for just a few minutes is talk to you about the work we were commissioned to do by Local Trust. Um, and uh, one minute, I don't know if I can get my screen to actually move. Um, so the work we did was looking at the economic basis for investment in social infrastructure. So really looking to try and build the economic case for investment, um, which obviously is particularly important um, when uh, trying to um, get money from government for investing um, in social infrastructure. Um, our work, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about sort of the broad, uh, a broad overview of what we did before I get a little bit into what the evidence is telling us. Um, so first off, our work was looking at so a social infrastructure definition, which was focused around um, the definition of community-led um, investment uh, kind of prioritized by the Community Wealth Fund. Um, so that was a definition focused on uh, what was feasible for communities to invest in um, across places and spaces, community organizations and connectedness. Um, and I know there are a wide variety of definitions of social infrastructure. So just wanted to make it clear what definition we'd use for the purposes of our research. Um, we reviewed over 100 papers um, uh, as part of our um, uh, evidence review, um, and we set a very high bar for evidence quality um, in terms of what could be included in any return on investment estimates that we created. Um, and, and in the setting of that bar, we were considering both sort of whether or not there was a plausible causal link between social infrastructure and an impact, um, and and also um, looking for studies where it was it, it was possible use the, the methods sort of supported identifying that causal impact robustly. Um, using the evidence, we then um, built a theory of change. Um, so looking at trying to sort of set out uh, the possible impacts that could result from uh, social infrastructure. And that was built primarily from the evidence review, but we tested that with a series of experts as part of our um, work. Um, and important to note, and I'll come on to show the theory of change in a moment, um, that what we find is evidence of wide ranging impacts uh, supported by uh, social infrastructure. Um, then we tried to translate that evidence into estimates of return on investment. So as I already said, we used high quality evidence uh, 
only. So we're looking for sort of uh, on the quantitative side for studies that were at least level three on the Maryland scale or some sort of meta uh, study that, that was sort of consistent with Green Book guidance. Um, where evidence was used, we applied very conservative assumptions in the application of that evidence to reach the numbers that we um, uh, created. Um, and important to note was that we were only possible, it was only possible to do that quantitative estimation for a subset of the impacts in which uh, we found um, identified in our theory of change. Um, so hopefully you can all see this slide. Um, what we've done here is to try and um, uh, kind of illustrate the theory of change that um, we we sort of find within the the literature, um, and actually these these mechanisms that we've documented on this slide are well supported by evidence. Um, so there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that there are kind of there is there are mechanisms uh, at play here between uh, social infrastructure and the outcomes that we're interested in. So just to talk through. A couple of those uh, at a high level, and obviously we can get into more details later if if, if it's of interest. Um, the first kind of uh, area we looked at was um, social capital and the links between um, social infrastructure investment and social capital. And actually, there's quite a um, strong and wide-reaching evidence base that shows that um, there are links between social infrastructure and social capital um, and in turn that those um, that investment in social capital kind of can lead to a range of social outcomes so that's health well-being crime and civic engagement um, to give some illustrations um, and then actually the the literature shows that um, because of the nature of uh, social infrastructure investments that are made um, there's actually a range of other capitals in an area that can be influenced by um, those investments. So some of them are physical in nature, for example, the creation of community hubs and assets. Um, others um, uh, kind of have a human capital aspect in the sense that they support volunteering or training or simply the development of aspirations in um, individuals. Um, and, and, and finally, there are a series of investments, particularly those that um, relate to green spaces, natural capital, um, that obviously build that natural capital in an area. Um, and the reason I guess this is important to, to sort of spell out is those other investments can also impact outcomes in an area um, via sort of, I guess, the more traditional um, economic growth literature. So looking at links between these capitals as drivers of local economic performance. There's a wide range of evidence that then supports that link and its consequent outcome on um, impact on economic outcomes, fiscal outcomes, and then obviously latterly with natural capital also thinking about um, environmental outcomes. And the only other thing I think it's worth pointing out, and I will come back to at some point, is um, the role of other complementary investments and policies. There's, there's a lot of evidence there to suggest that considering social infrastructure investment as part of a suite of investments in an area and understanding the links between different policies, um, different capitals is, is, is really important in terms of um, getting the, the sort of best return on your investment. Um, so then a couple of words on sort of quantification. So I'm not sure whether people have seen these numbers already, but um, the work that we did attempted to sort of estimate um, how much, uh, what would be the, the return on investment from a sort of typical million pound investment in a left behind area over a 10 year period. And we found um, benefits on both the economic and social side and on the fiscal side. Um, and on the economic and social side, we were able to sort of quantify um, impacts on increased employment, on increased health and well-being, and that particularly takes uh, place through the mechanisms related to volunteering and, and sports, um, an increased GVA in local areas, and also an impact on crime. Um, and then there are obviously related benefits um, on the, the fiscal side. I think what's really important to spell out here, though, is that this is a sort of a partial quantification of, of benefits. So it was not possible to quantify everything that was on the previous theory of change um, for a couple of reasons. In some areas, the evidence of 
the the scale of impact that can be associated with inf with investment in social infrastructure just isn't there yet. Um, and on others, actually, the evidence of that might be there, but it's just incredibly difficult um, to actually turn that into a sort of a monetary value. Um, and we haven't yet developed the evidence base that that supports that. Um, and just to spell out, I guess, a couple of areas where it wasn't possible to to quantify um, and potentially where it would be there would be value in future work um, kind of exploring um, the four sort of uh, biggest areas, I guess, were actually the the links to social cohesion, the the quantitative evidence on that is not yet as strong as it could be. Similarly, for civic engagement. Um, on reducing loneliness, actually, I think there is evidence um, uh, to show that um, investment in social infrastructure and, and social capital more generally in an area um, is associated with a um, reduction in loneliness. But at the point of this study, it wasn't possible to translate that into a sort of monetary estimate, um, although I think that is now possible. So that that is an area that has developed even since we uh, did the work last year. And then finally, environmental benefits, I don't think have been a particular focus of um, work in this area. And, and so that is still um, an area for future uh, kind of work. Um, so I think overall, what it's obviously possible to go a reasonable way with the with the existing evidence base. There are a couple of observations. I think there's that there, whilst there's a lot of papers that look um, in a qualitative sense at the links between um, social infrastructure investment and, and outcomes in local areas. Actually, some of those are quite old now. And so there's a question as to uh, kind of their, their relevance um, potentially. Um, and, uh, and also some of them don't necessarily do the really hard work to try and get a causation um, as much as they could. So really thinking about sort of what could happen, what the, what the counterfactual looks like and what is the real mechanism driving um, investment in social infrastructure linked to outcomes in an area. Also really important, I think, to explore more deeply what works in different local conditions. We know that local conditions matter hugely to the impact that social infrastructure can have. Um, and there isn't maybe enough done to explore um, between areas how similar sorts of investments have have taken effect and what the role of local conditions in driving those benefits has been and also to understand the role of complementary investment um, i think i'll just finish by saying i think that there is huge value that, um, that can be gained from sort of building and sharing this evidence base um, uh, over time um, and i think it's important both in terms of being able to share across areas, but also over time and learning from both success and failure, um, but also real focus on what the art of the possible. I think setting the bar too high for evidence in this in this context might not be helpful. Um, and actually, there is a definite question as to what good evidence looks like um, in social infrastructure terms um, that it's worth sort of, uh, I think future, uh, later sessions do actually um, touch on this issue. So that's it from me. I'll hand back over to the floor. Thank you, Sarah. So we'll move on to our next presenter. I think Sarah's here as I think your reflections on the way forward in terms of uh, collecting evidence in this area are particularly valuable. That's something that we can explore uh, in our questions uh, if we are choosing uh, in the latter part of this session. So on to our second uh, speaker online now. So Professor Peter Tyler, Professor at Urban Regional Economic uh, Department. Cambridge. So, Peter? During the research which we undertook for them, we looked extensively at the evidence from the New Deal for Communities and the Single Regeneration Budget, and um, we sought to understand and interpret economic change both from a broad perspective, that is the degree to which um, community-based initiatives were able to improve the general attractiveness of an area through the full range of place and people-based outcomes, <clears throat> but we also concentrated on a more narrow perspective where the uh, initiatives and the actions uh, focus more on trying to tackle uh, economic uh, things related to economic deprivation. Um, I was, we were very pleased to undertake this research because, as Sarah's pointed out, it's so important to ensure that we build on the evidence base as to what works. Um, we particularly focused on the New Deal for Communities 
because this provides a very good model to assess community-based regeneration. <clears throat> it was a program which sought to bring about a program of strategic change. It concentrated on areas of about 10,000 people, and it was very much concerned with what I suppose these days we call holistic regeneration that encompasses all the main outcome areas of housing, the physical environment, worklessness, and so on. And of course, it employed a partnership-based model with local communities at the heart of the process of that transformation. And uh, it involved communities uh, uh, being active board members. Um, and one of the key areas, which I think makes New Deal for Communities particularly appropriate, is that it uh, had a focus on engaging with mainstream delivery partners, uh, which is a crucial issue that we want to come on to. Um, the main findings from the research, just to uh, give a flavour of them, is that we tended to find, particularly from the experience of the New Deal for Communities, that it offered a very solid and clear model for how one could actively promote um, this sort of activity. And community-led partnerships were able to adopt a strategic, holistic approach in the best examples. Um, and what we tended to find is that um, the best performing initiatives tended to have the largest number of resident members and agencies on their boards. Um, and they were also characterised as areas with larger growing population and a catchment area of around 10,000 people seemed to work well. Particular success factors that was found in the research really was that building on existing uh, community infrastructures such as community associations was very important, uh, as was the, the need to adopt a bespoke approach, um, strategically focusing on more than just, say, worklessness. And crucially, and as I'll come back to this in a moment, it was essential to build connectivity with economic opportunities outside the immediate neighbourhood. And crucially, again, to work alongside and with mainstream service providers. Um, barriers to success, uh, just to uh, emphasise some of these, was that it was problematic if there were insufficient timescales and resources to bring about the regeneration activity involving the community. Um, and programmes which were poorly designed in terms of engagement with residents tended to have less better outcomes. And those programmes which particularly had weak links between local businesses and communities, something else I'll come back to in a moment. Um, and a crucial element throughout the whole uh, of the, the barrier analysis really was that it was important that mainstream service providers were uh, focusing and prioritising sufficiently the levels of need in the left behind communities that the New Deal was community was program was focusing on. And out of the, uh, the reading and thinking about the evidence base, it seemed that the some of the crucial policy recommendations that we may wish to discuss today was that um, it was very important to have appropriate community liaison officers, in other words, ambassadors with relevant agencies from the mainstream. It was very important to ensure that business mentors could make connectivity between community and local businesses. And this is an area, again, which has um, in the past probably not been emphasised enough. And um, as I'll say in a moment, um, particularly on the economic side of trying to bring about successful regeneration, it's very important to have a clear articulated local economic plan so that the national levelling up strategic agendas can be um, thought about and integrated. Uh, and in particular, how the local area can be uh, more adequately integrated into the wider economy. Um, I think what the evidence base shows clearly is the importance of what one might call a total place-based approach, um, building on um, a number of studies in that area. And what I would suggest, um, and perhaps for discussion, is that the, this approach really needs to identify the pathways by which community-based organisations and groups can become in, in work, involved in the work of relevant mainstream service providers and their respective agencies particularly as it relates to local economic development. And it's important to build a careful understanding of how the community and the area itself ties into the wider area of which it's a part. One of the significant problems, I think, with um, left behind areas and communities not experiencing adequate enough economic uh, growth is that they are um, very much di divorced from the local economy of which they're a part. And a big agenda for future work should be to seek to integrate them more adequately. Uh, we cannot have local areas which are deprived and their respective communities standing in, in isolation from the wider economic opportunity that's there. 
and throughout, I mean, the research emphasised the importance of a fundamental audit of people and place-based assets in the area, including land and property and core anchor institutions. But building a clear understanding of how the quality and quantity of mainstream service provision was determined, and particularly how it related to the needs of the local residents, was an important part in the whole process. And as Sarah mentioned, very important to have a clear theory of change uh, that showed how each policy intervention, as it was being delivered by community-based activity, how it could lead to positive change. And of course, this um, is a very important finding from the evidence base. I'll just stop there, Graham. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I think we'll move straight on to uh, Will now, who was truncated in his presentation. So Will, back over to you. So my name is Will Tanner, I'm Director of Onward, um, and uh, it's fantastic to be here, uh, as I said earlier. Um, so I think I just wanted to start by just saying I think we're at a really crucial moment for levelling up, and I think you heard a bit of it this in Andy's remarks earlier, but um, we are at the moment where we need to turn kind of theory into practice, uh, a 330-page white, white paper into uh, a delivery plan. Um, that is no easy task. And so this event is incredibly timely as a moment to reflect on what the evidence says and what we need to bear in mind as we get down uh, kind of into the weeds and make this happen. Um, and as the, the white paper was clear, this is not a uh, single momentary fix. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. This is going to require hard graft on the ground in communities uh, over a long period of time, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and uh, that does require a very disciplined uh, reading of the evidence and, and kind of relentless focus on, on what works. So it's fantastic to be here today. Um, I think uh, the, kind of the, first, the other thing that I just wanted to start by saying was that history shows very clearly um, uh, that we don't always look at the evidence in this space. Um, so the white paper talked about the culture of endless policy churn specifically within regeneration policy. There have been, I think, more than 50 local growth policies since the 1980s. Uh, Andy is smiling wryly. Um, uh, and um, let's be honest, they haven't had the desired effect, or very few of them have had very much of the desired effect. Um, the UK has, uh, by most counts, uh, greater inter-regional inequality um, than any OECD country apart from uh, Poland and Romania. Um, if you look at Philip McCann's work uh, from the University of Sheffield, um, if you look at uh, um, if you look at local earnings, for example, Germany, which of course was um, considerably more levelled down than us only 20 or 30 years ago, uh, only today has uh, has only 12% of people living in areas where the average wage is 10% or more below the national average. Uh, in the UK, that same figure is 35%. Um, so the UK has significantly more places where people are poor um, than, than Germany. Um, and a whole other set of statistics besides that you could um, uh, sit here and I would bore your ear off uh, for days on end with statistics about why the UK needs to level up and how level down we are. Um, so whatever we've been doing, it hasn't worked. Um, but there is actually, I think, quite a bit of evidence, and you've heard some of it from Pete and Sarah already, about what does work. Um, uh, we just haven't really been looking and we haven't been systematically applying that evidence uh, in, uh, in our policy interventions. Um, we, we undertook some work um, supported by Local Trust and Power to Change last year um, called Turnaround, which looks specifically at the lessons from 60 years of regeneration policy. We looked at everything from Harold Wilson's urban, uh, urban aid areas right through to uh, the single regeneration budgets of the 1990s right through to the New Deal for communities. And we looked at what evaluations were out there, in turn, including, I should say, Pete's um, fantastic evaluation of New Deal for communities. Um, and we also looked at uh, what data existed from those places. And the lessons, I think, are pretty clear. Um, we drew out uh, six key lessons, um, which reflect a lot of what's been said already today, but I think are uh, kind of worth repeating. So the first is that the participation of communities themselves is completely and utterly essential to the task at hand. Um, and that is for three very specific and important reasons. The first of that, of which is that you tackle the actual rather than the perceived needs of communities if you involve communities yourselves. There is, I, I sit in Whitehall, I sit in a, an ivory tower where I uh, pretend to understand the challenges of uh, different places, but one of the things we try and do at Onward is get out into communities and talk to people about the challenges they are themselves facing. I was in South Shields last week and I can tell you that the, the, the people of South Shields have a very different view of 
the challenges that they face than even their local council. Um, there is a disconnect between politicians and policymakers and communities, and if you involve communities, you can close that gap um, and actually tackle the real needs uh, of those people and the, the community that they face. Um, the second thing, uh, and the second reason why this is important, is it ensures that the communities themselves are invested in that change after the period of intervention itself. So we know from history that uh, policymakers get excited about something for a period of time and then they move on to the next bit of the news cycle or the, or the next important issue at hand. And we've seen that time and time again. But communities themselves are still there. They're still facing those challenges. Um, and if you can create an apparatus by which communities are involved um, in uh, the intervention, then they can carry it on after politicians have moved, moved on. And the third reason is it builds capacity. And you see this very clearly in some of Pete's work in the New Deal's communities. You can see this in the single regeneration budget. When, when communities are themselves involved um, and build some of that internal capacity to make change, they are much less reliant on top-down intervention from policymakers, either at a national level or at a local or regional level. So participation of communities is fundamental. The second thing, and the second reason or kind of lesson, I think, from the last 60 years of regeneration policy, is that upfront investment matters. Um, so, uh, and it matters particularly because it helps communities themselves to participate. So it reinforces the first lesson. Um, and ways in which you can do this effectively, and things that were, were successful, including in NDC, were the introduction of a kind of year zero. So giving communities a year to kind of get up to speed, um, giving them upfront investment to do that, to build some of that capacity, that capability, in order to participate fully, rather than just assuming that communities can kind of start from the get-go, can kind of uh, achieve leveling up from a standing start. Um, in practical terms, that might mean smaller investments early and kind of staggering investments over time, rather than expecting communities to deal with one big lump sum of funding uh, up front. And it might also mean a kind of different approach to commissioning or, or local government interaction with communities um, so that you're not expecting uh, communities to be able to deal with all of the bureaucracy of local authorities or, 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 or kind of policy making um, from a standing start. For example, Be Inspired in Leicester, if you look at um, back on the map in Sunderland, those are places where they have taken an asset-based approach. They may even be in this room, and if they are, I pay tribute to you, but, but kind of where they have taken, uh, whether those are uh, physical assets, kind of um, housing stock or, or, or local buildings, um, and turned them into long-term either uh, revenue streams or, or long-term assets that the community can gather around. And you see that in, in more recent policy interventions too. So uh, what the his, uh, Historic England is doing around uh, historic action zones and heritage development trusts is another classic example of taking, uh, in that case, kind of beautiful old buildings uh, at the center of their communities and turning them into long-term assets rather than often vacant and, uh, and derelict buildings that can actually weigh communities down. Um, the third lesson, sorry, the fourth lesson, um, is that new civic governance can be really, really helpful. Not always necessary, but, um, but in some places does seem to be helpful. And we looked at some international evidence in our study. Uh, we looked at both Berlin and Turin, where they've taken some quite innovative approaches to building kind of specific civic governance around communities themselves. So in Berlin, they have a, an approach called uh, neighborhood management, which actually was trialed in this country in the late, in the late noughties, um, where communities effectively come together, they form a management board, and they, they take more direct control of their neighborhood. Uh, in Turin, there is something called pacts, for co pacts of cooperation, uh, where local authorities uh, partner much more actively uh, with their community is actually not dissimilar to what's been happening in Wigan and some other places in this country. Um, and those type of approaches form a kind of a governance structure by which communities have a direct say in uh, the governance of their place. Um, and they create a kind of institutional mechanism by which communities can be involved, which just often isn't there in some of our in our other structures. And Andy talked a little bit about parish councils earlier. I'm a great fan of parish councils for precisely that reason. They create a kind of governance structure, an institutional form through which communities can, can have a more direct say over their place. And crucially, they're hyper-local. And I think that's, that's just one other lesson that I would, I would stress within this section. Just, just hyper-locality is really important. Actually, neighborly, the neighbor, neighbor, neighborhood level um, is, uh, is often the best unit of geography. And there's a bit of a risk, especially with centralized policymaking in Whitehall, to constantly elevate things to a to much higher level where some of this more community-led uh, uh, work is less effective. Um, just two more lessons, and then I will shut up, because I'm sure you've got question and answers. But um, uh, the, the fifth lesson is um, 
we need to focus on social fabric as well as economic capital. Um, so just a short anecdote, we were in Oldham recently, and this is the kind of classic case study of why physical investment is not the be-all and end-all. I was in a, a focus group with local residents, um, and we were talking about the tram. Uh, it's not far from here, of course. And uh, the tram arrived in Oldham a few years ago, seen by local leaders as a great, shining example of investment in Oldham, a place that had been downtrodden for too long. I asked people about the tram. The exact quote that came back immediately was, Oldham was on the edge, and then the tram arrived and it pushed us over. And the reason was that the tram had become a magnet for antisocial behavior, for crime. Uh, most people we spoke to in Oldham would not take the tram for fear of uh, criminal activity. Um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that lightly, that's a kind of significant thing to say, but it, it kind of really, really hit us that the tram, which was meant to be this kind of, this great kind of uh, regional investment uh, in an area that needs leveling up, um, had not achieved its aims because it hadn't been part of a wider social fabric uh, kind of investment. Um, and then the, the sixth lesson, the final thing I would say is the importance of long-termism. Uh, I said at the beginning that this is a 15, 20 year mission. Uh, we really do need to invest in the long term. And one of the, one of the kind of lessons from NDC, I think, is that um, even the kind of 10-year time horizon that NDC uh, invested over is probably not enough. I mean, we, we evaluated NDC as part of our study, and we found that there was significant falls in, in deprivation in the 39 areas, or in the majority of 39 areas, but about 77% um, of those areas, over that NDC period. But a lot of the progress was lost after... 2010, when the investment started to fall away. Um, and, uh, and so I think there is a lesson about long-termism and sustained investment over a long period of time that often doesn't really align very well with policymakers' funding cycles in Whitehall. Um, so that's it for me, and I look forward to the q Thank you, Will. So before we go into questions, we firstly heard from Sarah and her work on the quantification of the impacts of a community wealth fund on communities, uh, and also her thoughts on where that research could go. We heard from Peter and his work on the New Deal for communities, his reflections as well, on, particularly on the, the, the key factors in success, both within and outside of those communities, particularly the economic impacts and the link is very important there. We heard from Will and his six lessons uh, from the review of regeneration policies approaches of recent years. Now, before we take questions from the floor, we're going to attend, we have an online question, so from our online audience. So our first question uh, is from Julia Parnaby from the National Lottery Community Fund. Julia's question is, Charity and community work provides the biggest untapped source of evidence, but it is complex to evaluate. The standards of evidence are not at an academic level, so building traction is hard. But does the panel have any advice on how to best utilise this form of evidence? So can you hear me out there? Can you hear that question? Sarah, you're nodding, which I take to be you can hear it. So showing technology does work. Sarah, what's your views? <laughs> I, c I definitely heard the question. Brilliant. Um, I think, uh, so I don't think I've got an immediate answer for, for Julie, but I think there are a number of things that certainly come through when we've reviewed the evidence base to date that are really important. And probably top of the list is um, sort of really thinking very hard about the counterfactual and sort of how you explain what... Um, what the investment is doing and why you wouldn't expect to see that other, you know, otherwise thinking very hard about how you present that channel of impact um, and get the supporting evidence in place around that. And I think then that, you know, would be a very valuable contribution to, um, to the evidence base. The other, the other thing I would say is that quite often the evidence on um, sort of areas uh, can be quite sporadic, i.e. you see evidence on one area, but there aren't comparisons with similar things taking place in other areas. And so the extent that community organisations can do exercises to compare and contrast and learn from each other and bring together a bigger body of evidence about what they see working in different places, I think that, again, could be really, really helpful. Um, so it's sort of, I guess, trying to make it a, a more conceptually rigorous without necessarily thinking that it's going to, you know, be really high on the, the Maryland scale for quantitative evidence. I think that's potentially unrealistic. Thank you, Sarah. Peter, do you have the question? Yes, I did, didn't quite get all the question, I think, Grant, but I would emphasise two things. Firstly, the immense importance of using the evidence base that we've got for addressing any questions that come up. And I think there's a tendency 
for a lot of um, uh, analysis to largely uh, new policy formulation, just to largely forget that there's been history and quite a lot of good programs to look at what they've achieved. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is that it's very important within any individual initiative to understand the variation that exists um, within that initiative between partnerships. And this was particularly a feature of SRB and NDC, where the actual um, partnership working could vary quite substantially. And this is why in the NDC slide I mentioned, it's important to look at the areas that really did very well indeed, because they, they can often demonstrate things which even within the same program um, are worth looking at and understanding. Thank you, Peter. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, there are two things I would say. So firstly, it is possible to measure some things. So we created a social fabric index measuring the strength of community in every local authority across the country two years ago. And we're repeating the exercise uh, this year to, to give a kind of post-pandemic indication. Um, and that that is measuring maybe not the, uh, the success of a particular intervention, but it is measuring the strength of community that can be used to support uh, some of the some of the kind of business case or the or the evidence base for for specific types of intervention and with more of that data over time we will we will develop a more a more granular picture um, the other thing i would say is that scale really matters here so one of the things the white paper did that got very little attention but i think is actually fundamentally going to be the most or one of the most important things it does is it set out a really strong case for much more local uh, data collection and publication across a whole range of different social and economic indicators and went, mu went much further than beyond the kind of traditional economic basket that the ONS traditionally looks at. And where that, where that work goes could be really transformative in this space because if you can have uh, very granular kind of uh, hyper-local estimates for, um, for a range of social fabric indicators, whether that's social trust or, 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 or neighborliness or whatever, um, then you can start to benchmark specific interventions against those things and show, controlling for other factors, um, a, a correlation between your intervention and, uh, and success. And we can start to actually have a, have a more sophisticated uh, debate about what works at that hyper-local level, whereas at the moment I think we're constantly being pulled up to levels of geography which don't always suit the civic or charitable sector. Um, so some of that work I think is potentially really important. Thank you, Will. So we've taken an online question, so let's have a question from the room. Uh, let's try and go right to the back. Lady over there, you're looking behind yourself. You are the one. Yes, you're waving. Yes. Thank you. Hiya, I'm Beth from a social enterprise called Renacy. Um, my question is around, can you hear me all right? Yeah. We can now. My question is around um, sort of how we think about communities, and I'm so conscious that we tend to think about oh, giving power to communities, and then it's sort of a you know it's, it's done, and actually thinking about whose voices are heard within that and whose voices aren't. So I suppose my question is when we think about the evidence, how much are those limitations taken into account about the fact that we might not have heard some voices, and also I guess how much are we challenging kind of how we conceptualise communities and who we may think of within those communities and whose voices we might still not be hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, did you catch that question out there? More or less. See if you can, your answer, see if it fits with the question. So we can put the two things together. Let's have a go. Well, I can say it for you. Basically, essentially, I think if you can hear me better, I think the question was really about voices in communities. How, how do we ensure that we capture all the voices in communities? And how do we conceive of communities? What do we mean by communities when we're talking about this, this area of work? In your research, how do we ensure we get all the voices in the community? So we know there are different voices in communities, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean another really good question. Um, yeah. And again, not an easy one to answer. To some extent, on the work we've done to date, it's been a backward-looking exercise of what evidence out there is already saying is true of communities. Um, and there are, I think, as the... As the participant pointed out there are a, a wide range of definitions um, for that. I think, so I'm not sure I'm going to answer this perfectly, but one of the things that certainly comes through in the literature is the importance of social bridging capital, i.e. bringing diverse groups and hear it, bringing them together um, uh, as a means of, of actually improving social capital in an area, but perhaps also as a method for ensuring that you get those full range of voices heard. Um, and I think social bridging capital is a really critical thing that seems to be sort of highlighted in, in the literature. Um, and I, I think 
it is a real challenge in this work and I know from com you know conversations we've had with local trusts throughout that you know that ha then how you go about empowering a community can really matter in terms of kind of what impact you can deliver because clearly if you are um, essentially giving autonomy to a subset of the community um, it's important that they have an understanding of the needs of the whole community and you aren't simply sort of um, I guess giving it to those best place to use it as opposed to those most in need so I think it's a real challenge for um, for the evidence base but I think um, certainly some of the work that's done around things mentioned by Will and other sort of metrics to try and understand get a proper full picture of um, the breadth of views in communities is a really important starting point and then and then I think there could be you know um, a case to be made about creating a bit of a virtuous circle for ensuring over time that you bring those community voices in. Can I, can I just say, Graham, that yes. I, I, did, I think I picked up most of that. Good. Um, uh, the one, one clear way forward is to ensure representation on partnership type boards. Um, mm -hmm. NDC were, was good at this and also the best examples in SRB. So uh, getting effective voice means really mm -hmm. understanding um, the nature of the community and how it can be represented in partnership based structures. And when that works, it can work exceedingly well. Thank you, Peter. And it came through in your presentation as well. Well, what's your experience on this for your review of the evidence? Well, so seen? I'd largely echo what, what Sarah and Peter said. I mean, the other thing I would say is that um, uh, so it's, it's easy to under, underestimate the importance of local institutions that sit out with the kind of the formal structures of local government. And so involving uh, local civic organisations that might play an outsized role in the community but aren't always represented in of local government boards and others is particularly important because they often are the, the kind of gateway or the catalyst for engaging uh, underrepresented gr under groups. Um, so, uh, so, so kind of not, not constantly going to the usual suspects when trying mm. to set up a local, uh, a local project or, or, or indeed trying to evaluate it, actually kind of involving um, organisations which, which play a great role but, but aren't always represented. Thank you, Will. Uh, I would like to take more questions, but unfortunately we are approaching lunch. We only have 45 minutes of lunch as well, and I don't want to overrun. So before we thank our, uh, our panellists in the usual way, just kind of one... Can you still hear me? One kind of final overall reflection, I'd say, for myself, is that Will mentioned an asset-based approach uh, to the work that's successful in, in the field of, of community-led regeneration, but I think an asset-based approach to evidence as well might be something we can think about. What's come through this session is the idea there is, there is, as Peter pointed out and, and others, there is always deficits, there is gaps in what we understand about what works and where success and what needs to be done, and Sarah pointed to that as well. But there is also a stock and, and built of evidence there that exists that we can build upon. An asset-based approach there could be very, very important. Rather than starting what we don't have in terms of what we know, let's see what we do have in terms of what we know. I think also we saw it again in Julie and her question there, I think after encouraging us to think more clearly about what evidence exists within charity community work and how we can try to bring that evidence forward, how that could have an impact in how we understand our work and shape our policies and practices going forward. So an asset-based approach there and evidence could also be an interesting approach to take forward. Hopefully it gives a good start for the rest of the day. I'd like to thank all the panellists, uh, particularly uh, Peter and Sarah and Will out there in a conventional way. And uh, we'll see you all after lunch for the next keynote speaker, uh, Andy Burnham, of course, at 1pm. So thank you very much.